everyone. Welcome to the Key to My Research podcast of the University of Tübingen. My name is Laura and I have a special guest today, an expert in mental health who researches on gender-related differences. Welcome, Professor Dr. Birgit Dandl. Glad to have you here. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> You're welcome. Who are you and what do you do? I investigate gender-related differences um, in terms of brain activation, brain function. So I'm very interested in how the brain works in women, men and non-binary individuals. But I'm also interested in how, if you see activation in the brain, how that is related to behavior. And in terms of behavior, what interests me is emotions. It's empathy, it's stress, it's emotional regulation. So these, so these social affective aspects of our behavior, that's what's of interest to me. Because it's also relevant if we talk about patients with mental disorders. I'm a psychotherapist as well, so I also have clinical duties to do, and I'm also interested in the translation. So what is happening in healthy or non-disordered or neurotypical individuals, and how does that translate to patients with different mental disorders? Um, how did you get there? Did you ever think you're going to end up in this field, or what was your career path to get where you are right now? Maybe I thought that that would be always the ultimate dream <laughs> to do so. But I started very small with emotion research, uh, investigating emotion recognition. So really just imagine you see a facial expression. What emotion does this facial expression present? And that was my master thesis. And there I also looked into sex differences because we know that females are better in recognizing emotions than men and also our data showed this. And then for the PhD, I moved on to actually look into the brain and what's happening in the brain when people recognize those emotional faces. So that actually laid the path to the brain, linking it with behavior. And also during the doctoral, uh, during my doctoral studies, we also started with um, looking into the menstrual cycle. And that is now 20 years ago. So we were one of the first to actually look into how the menstrual cycle affects brain activation and also behavioral aspects of that. And I think this all built up into the women's mental health focus that I have now. And that is, yeah, it's, 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 just, it's just a dream come true to actually investigate what I like to investigate and what I can also now. Um, so I think that built up from the master thesis to now being here in Tübingen. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about this, this means there's a lot of differences between the mental health of men and the mental health of women. Or how would you explain that to listeners that are not that much into the topic yet? Mm -hmm. I think there are different facets that we need to talk about. The first one would be probably talk about the risk for certain mental disorders that women and men face. And yes, we do know that there are different prevalence rates. So the risk is way higher, for example, for a woman to be diagnosed with depression. It's twice, actually. Then uh, for a man versus we have different disorders like autism, which is higher in men than in women. So the risk to be diagnosed with a certain mental disorder, we know that there are sex differences. We know about these sex differences actually for decades because the data hasn't changed and the data hasn't changed globally. So it doesn't matter whether we talk about India, whether we talk about Austria, my uh, country, or Germany, where we are now here. It doesn't matter because we do see these prevalence differences around the world. And we still cannot explain them. We do have some theories why they appear, but we cannot e explain them fully. And one of them, of course, comes with, well, women and men may be raised differently. So the expectations for women and men are different. And then we talk probably more about gender differences. So what are the roles that women and men have to fulfill in society and how we are raised The others are more biological uh, theories that we have, for example, sex hormones, because women undergo, or most females actually undergo, a menstrual cycle. We know that these hormones actually influence brain activation, brain function, and also mood symptoms. So there might be different reasons why we do see the different prevalence rates. Then, besides the risk, there's also what symptoms 
do the individuals actually show for the disorders? And here we also see that women and men show different dis symptoms, actually. They also show similar symptoms. But there are some differences that we also know about. And here we also need to see how, do, how does that influence actually our diagnostics? Do we have a diagnostic bias that we should probably also talk about? So here we have also, again, a different aspect. So we have the risk, we have the symptoms that the individuals present, and then we have treatment. And for treatment, there we really also can expect sex differences. Problem is that for most of our treatments, we actually only have data from males. So in terms of psychopharmacology, you just think of taking an antidepressant, for example, to be treated for depression. Most of the data that we have relies on male and on male animals. So that is kind of hard to infer what will happen to a woman if she takes the antidepressant or the antipsychotic or whatever medication we talk about. So I think, yes, there are different facets when we talk about mental disorders or mental health that is affected by our biological sex and is also affected by our gender. Mm -hmm. You just described also that there is a little bit of a gap when it comes to research and that there was more research on male um, models so what would you say is the gap like? How many years are we talking or how much lag is there right now that needs to be filled? It's huge. It may not feel that huge for everybody listening now to the podcast, but in terms of data and in terms of hard science and facts, it's huge. We lack most of the data and um There's a very nice uh, movie that colleagues from ours from California actually put together. And if you kind of put uh, numbers to how much do we know about certain things, it's only 0.5% that has been dedicated to women's mental health of our research. So we know more actually about the flora of the seas. We know more about erectile dysfunction. We know more of many other things then we know about women's mental health. And I think this is a huge gap that we have. So we need to get together to collect data and to inform the women about their mental health and also their risks for mental health. Mm -hmm. How does that also make you feel as a female researcher to know about this gap? I think it's uh, a strong indication for me to move on and to put our effort here to really kind of collaborate with everybody. But it's also something where I'm happy that we are kind of trying to fill the gap. So we are providing data right now. And um, we also have now an international research training group here in Tübingen, which is really a wonderful thing because now 12 doctoral researchers all work in the direction of women's mental health, contributing different data to this in collaboration with Swedish colleagues. And I think this is the future to together look into aspects and really learn from each other and then also discuss what is needed as a next project, as a next step, and how does the data that we gather translate into mental health care. Mm -hmm. What was one of the, or maybe also more um, surprising findings in your research That just popped to your mind. Surprising. Well, I mean, there, there are lots of surprises when you uh, don't see the effects that you expect to see, which happens, I guess, all the time. Um, one of the studies where I'm really happy that we did it and um, now others are following is, for example, to gather data on the pregnant brain. Um, to really investigate what is happening during pregnancy because up to the time when we started and now others are also collecting data and presenting them and I'm happy that we get there. We actually didn't know what is happening during this time in the brain and um, it's, it's just such an enormous, it's the biggest hormonal influx that you can imagine what is happening to a body, to a female body actually. Uh, so we have to assume, or we had to assume, now I have to take past tense, we had to assume that something's happening there, but still the data was not there. So we and others now tried to actually get the data, to collect the data and to see. And then, astonishingly, not much was different in the pregnant brain than we thought. So um, 
there are different reasons for that. Maybe it was the wrong timing during pregnancy. Uh, maybe it was also you, we did a pre, we did a paradigm looking for emotional regulation. Maybe that's not the right paradigm to actually look into. Although I think it is the right one, but maybe uh, address it a little bit differently. So. There was not that much difference, and that was astonishing to us as well, because we thought that there should be something, but maybe there's something later, or maybe it's not during pregnancy, maybe it's actually the postpartum period, that is. But right now, colleagues around the world collect data. and This will inform us when to explicitly expect changes to the brain. Mm -hmm. Is there some more results about um, different stages in the female cycle, maybe not pregnancy, but puberty or menopause. Is there in other fields more data actually? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I guess pregnancy was left out a lot because of the vulnerability of um, the woman at that time. Uh, but we know more, not a lot, more. What is happening during puberty, we know also a little bit what is happening during the menstrual cycle. We do have a handful of data that shows us what is happening when women start taking oral contraceptives, for example. But we only have one study that shows what is happening if women stop taking oral contraceptives. Uh, and we do have, again, several studies that looked into menopausal transition. So yes, we do know more for other hormonal transition periods, but still it's kind of um, not a lot if you compare it to other uh, conditions, if you compare it to half of the populations undergoing all of these hormonal transitions and not knowing how they affect our behavior, our brain and also our mental health. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about mental health, you mentioned a lot hormones and you also mentioned that maybe different factors on how people are raised also contribute to the differences um, gender related. Is there a percentage you can say how much is hormonal related maybe and how much is more the other factors? Is there something that we know already? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare say there's a percentage of what the hormones contribute in comparison to what gender or education or the environment or your whatever we call it social surroundings, peers, etc. contribute. Because if I just talk about hormones, hormones, it may be we think about the menstrual cycle and the fluctuations. If we talk about uh, women or females, if we talk about men or males, you probably think about andropause. So they also have a decline. Or we think about testosterone, which has a circadian rhythm. So it's higher in the morning, it's lower in the afternoon. So of the, that, of course, is also of interest to look into. And there might be effects there. But all of that is also based on your genes and your genetics. And then it kind of opens up another perspective on this as well. So biology is huge and the social is also huge. And I wouldn't dare to say the hormones play 8% in all of this. <laughs> Understood. When you talk about women, men, and in general, the female brain, how do you specify female? And how is this all related with also transgender or non-binary people? How is this affecting the studies? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's that's a wonderful question that you ask because I have not uh, said how I defined it, but I used it up to now. So in terms of female, that's how we ask our participants, what is your sex assigned at birth? So they kind of give it to us, so they tell us what it is. But we also ask them about their gender. So what is the gender that you now have and that you would self um explain to you. So are you a woman? Are you a man? Are you somewhere in between? And uh, if the female and the woman kind of overlap, so if we have a female that also feels as a woman, we talk about a cis woman. And if we have a male, a biological male, who also says that I'm a man, then we have a cis man. And that's actually the majority of the population. But of course, you raised non-binary and trans individuals. Um, and I think here, the next gap is opening up. Mm -hmm. Because when I talked about how less we know about women's mental health, there's actually even less, little, 
that we know are non-binary or trans individuals and what's happening to their mental health when they transition, for example, uh, or when they have long-term long -term consequences of a hormonal therapy or gender-affirming surgery, all of these aspects. There's not much data available and it also is another um, indication where we really need to collaborate and really need to invest and kind of put up the data to inform them about what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Do you feel some development in that area, that there is some, some drive coming into that field? Absolutely. Uh, I think yes. I think, but what we probably have to be careful is, uh, on is that in the general media, I have the feeling that gender and non-binary and trans is everywhere. And we talk about how we put gender in our language and how we should address and speak. And I think these are essential points. But when we then go to science and really talk about how many studies in Germany are right now funded investigating trans individuals or non-binary individuals, it's actually such a low amount of studies. So we need more investigation. We need more data on this. And I think there's a discrepancy between the general picture of how we treat um, these individuals and how we talk about them and actually what science can contribute to this discussion. So uh, I think this is uh, something where we are just starting to get sensitive. And of course, you have uh, individuals here, non-binary trans individuals who are reaching out and telling us that there is something that they are not seen, that they are not respected, that there is actually not much knowledge in them for the medical health care. So we also need to provide them with information. What would you think is the consequence if we don't have more funding for something like this in the future? What do you think happens if we don't start changing the way we do research now? If we stick to the old days half of the population will be neglected. Half of the population will be misdiagnosed and will probably also suffer from the consequences in terms of treatment. And if, so that's for the women. And if we talk about trans and non-binary, I think it's the same what's happening there. There will be a group of people, a group of individuals who will not get the right treatment for their condition. And where is your research at right now? What would you say um, are current challenges, um, despite the fact that there's not that much data, but what is the challenge right now that you're looking at? The challenge is right now, um, if you do research with uh, women and if you're interested in menstrual cycle, pregnancy, uh, menopausal transition, there's a challenge in actually recruiting the women. There's a challenge in inviting them at the right time to our lab. There's a challenge in actually um, estimating everything that we then have when they are here. Once they are here, is it really the correct timing? We only know afterwards in terms of the hormones, for example, because we take a blood sample, but we analyze it later. So uh, I guess there are many challenges that we are facing, but they are the same everywhere um, around the world uh, for groups that uh, investigate hormonal transition periods in women. So... We already talked about the pregnancy topic. When you talk about puberty, for example, what is something that is a result in the studies right now? How are mental health issues related to gender in puberty? You said something like um, women are more affected by mental health trouble than men. How? What can you say to that? The interesting thing about puberty being an interesting phase in general, in girls and boys, of course, uh, is that when girls and boys hit puberty, the gender gap starts in terms of mental health prevalence rates. So then we actually see that, for example, depression is twice as likely to be diagnosed in a girl than in a boy. And all of these disorder discrepancies that I mentioned before they actually kick off with puberty. We do not see it for most of the disorders before puberty, but when they actually enter puberty, it's becoming a huge gap that we then see in terms of prevalence rates. And there is also, of course, lots of changes with puberty that occur there as well. So the hormones, the menstrual cycle, for example, starts, etc. So all of these aspects contribute potentially to this gender gap that we then see in the prevalence rates. Um, 
I'm not doing uh, puberty research because I focus on adult individuals, but there is a very interesting research in terms of puberty and adolescence and youth here in Tübingen as well. And they are actually in within this international research training group. We are investigating puberty. We are investigating stress reactions, social media use, for example, also, and how that affects mental health. So these are parts in the international research training group. And you said you research a lot about um, adults specifically. Um, is also the menopause and the period influential? And how does that play a role? Yeah, that's absolutely now my my next big thing after being pregnant and having had a menstrual cycle. I will hit the menopausal transition someday. I don't know when. <laughs> so, of course, I want to investigate what's happening here and how can I go through this period uh, without having risks for mental health issues. Uh, so, yes, we investigate uh, the menopausal transition, the perimenopause, as it's called, as the state between as when you transfer, actually. And um, I mean, this period is super interesting, but again, we don't have much data. And if I now tell you that um, the the duration of the perimenopause is uh, four years, but it could actually be two to eight years, and we don't know which individual will face a two years transition versus who are those that actually transition for several years and even longer and what will be the symptoms like. Because a third of the women transitioning, they won't have a lot of symptoms. They will transition and it will be all right. A third will have symptoms and they will suffer. And another third will have severe symptoms. So This is actually also where we don't know who are the individuals who will have the less symptoms or will have more symptoms. We don't know. And of course, there are some theories that we are now working on, um, maybe some hormone sensitive women. So that there's a subgroup of women who are particularly sensitive to hormonal transitions, which also shows when they start taking oral contraceptives, for example, or when they've been pregnant so that they particularly respond to those hormonal influences. But that could also be then for the for the menopausal transition. But we're not sure about this. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lot of variables too. So it will probably also be tricky to get a study group there, no? It is tricky, but uh, I have, we have the right person doing this uh, study project right now. And we put a lot of effort in recruiting the women um, and I guess what in general is that women are interested in the research. I think that that's super. It's re really helpful for recruitment. Of course, then when we come with our specific inclusion and exclusion criteria, that's then harder. But in general, we are very lucky that there's a lot of interest in the research in general. But yeah, we have to collect data and we have to run the study. So we also need participants from Tübingen, but also from around um, that could come in and that want to participate and then want to take uh, part in our studies to also contribute data to the lack that we want to fill, to the gap that we want to fill. So all of this interesting research you're doing, you are doing at the University of Tübingen. What do you like about the University of Tübingen? Mm, I didn't know Tübingen before moving here. I was just told that it's very cozy. Uh, so when I came here for the first time, It was cozy, but it was also very small. Uh, so every time we moved, we moved to a smaller city from Vienna to Aachen, from Aachen to Tübingen. So it kind of became smaller. But um, it's a very nice and a wonderful um, atmosphere that we have here in Tübingen. And I guess one of the benefits of being such a small university town is that everybody is close by. You can actually meet with everybody and we can exchange and uh, the communication and the collaboration between the colleagues is super and is really excellent. I guess that is what motivates and what gives tubing in such a special atmosphere that we want to collaborate because we have to. It's so small and everybody is nearby um, and we do then collaborate. And this is really um, perfect. Um, and in your field where it's a lot about uh, women's health, Is there also a lot of female researchers or how does the work field look there? Is there also men researching in that field? How can you actually explore that? Yeah, I guess in the ter in terms of 
women's mental health, if we really talk only about women, we have a lot of wonderful female researchers. There is not many male researchers in that field. But when you talk about gender sensitive medicine or gender related topics, then we do have also male, we do have a broader, a more diverse group of scientists who is interested in the topics, I would say. What would be your vision when it comes to that, when it comes to um, more gender specific treatment of mental health? What is your vision or your wish in general? Where should we get to? My ideal would be that um, you see the individual and based on the individual and we would have to find out which characteristics are those that kind of identify the individual besides sex, gender, age, probably education or you name it. Um, Everybody is treated uh, with the right medication, the right treatment and is also respected. Um, and I guess that is what individualized medicine has as its core. But in my opinion, we are far away in terms of mental health. We are way better when it comes to cancer and other disciplines in medicine. But I think for the mental health, we really have to invest a lot in the next years, in the next decades. How far away are we? What would you say? <laughs> Well, I mean, we just founded the German Center for Mental Health um, and Tübingen is part of it. So um, I do believe that we could in 10, 15 years uh, definitely have improved. So I guess with every year that we invest in those areas, we will have some improvement. But really that you enter uh, a, a practice and see a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist And um, you will get the diagnosis based on your individual characteristics and also the treatment following this. I guess this will take some time. So I guess 10, 15 years is realistic. Okay, let's hope that we get there soon. Um, what would you think can help you to get there even faster? Or is there a possibility to speed it up somehow to get there maybe in... Eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the numbers are really uh, uh, tricky here. And I probably also with 10 to 15 years didn't say it correctly. Maybe the eight years is more realistic. We would have to see and we would have to also exchange here. But in general, if you ask me of how can we speed up the things, um, I guess there are several ways that we could go. It's meaning involving the public to kind of also make them aware of all of these aspects, but to also engage with the public a lot. And I guess something like this, something like a podcast, hopefully also listened to not only by uh, scientific, by colleagues, but also by lay women and men who are interested in what's happening here, is also a step into educating, into engaging with the public to also talk about these aspects. Then I guess it's also about funding. And here we talk about a lot of funding. So this is not something where we have a single project, but we really need federal money to go into this and to really invest into mental health. And I think the first step was taken with the funding, with establishing the German Center for Mental Health. And also, uh, like our international research training group, it's also big funding schemes that we have now and we need them because they last longer. It's now five years that we are funded and hopefully have another funding period coming up. So this is really a difference to many other funding schemes that we have available to us, but we cannot think in long terms. And I think for this topic, it's really necessary to do that and to speed it up, I guess, the more the merrier. So uh, if there are topics that uh, we can share and we can in a collaborative fashion work together. And that's what we also tried now with the Swedish colleagues and we, what we're also trying now with um, colleagues from Can Canada, from Austria, from Co uh, Denmark and so forth. I think if we get together and if we exchange, that's really, really helpful because we may have borders, but actually women live everywhere. And if we improve healthcare for women, we also improve it for men. And that normally sells the point. Then if I say, well, it, it is of relevance to half of the population, but actually it's of relevance for the whole population. Because if you can think of a tailored uh, treatment for women, 
then you can also say, well, then there must also be a tailored treatment for men, right? Because if the one group is served individually, the others will as well, because we have tested it then. So I guess that's also where we could speed up is say everybody is concerned. So let's get together and do something. That makes a lot of sense to me, actually. So you also mentioned um, that the perception of the general public would help if there's an awareness to that topic. How are the reactions right now when you talk about your research or are people actually aware? What kind of reactions do you get when you talk about your research? Mm. Mm, I guess when we have presentations or when I have presentations in front of a group of women, for example, they are highly interested in the topic and normally say that's very interesting that you investigate that. Um, if we talk about um, non-binary trans, um, they are also super helpful and very interested in what's happening. But here it starts that probably the scientists don't address all the needs of this group of uh, individuals. So I think here, and that brings me back to my engagement, actually, I think we need to engage with the individuals. And for now, I guess the women's mental health aspect was something where we decided, well, that's the projects we start with. But the further we go, the more engagement we need because we really need to address the needs of women. And so we need to get in a discussion. We need to get in a dialogue with them. We need to assess the needs and then transform them into scientific questions that we can address again in the lab and at the university level. Mm -hmm. So that would be how I would address um, the way this research is currently perceived. And I have not received a lot of criticism. Um, I do get some emails in this regards telling me, okay, you are doing something sexist and you're doing something excluding men and how can I allow this um, and so forth. So we do get these emails, but fortunately um, we have not had a scandal in the group, but I know of colleagues who had that. So I think it's also, and I'm, I'm very happy that you asked me about um, the female, women, male men aspect, because I think it's lots of language and how we express and how we use the language um, that leads to misunderstandings and that probably also leads to stereotypes uh, so that we have a stereotypical thinking and this is this fulfilled or not. And I guess here we really have to be careful when we particularly address sex and gender differences or similarities. Because everybody, we could say, is an expert in this regards. And this is different if I talk about schizophrenia or, or something else. It's not the whole population. We are experts and I'm meeting with experts, but uh, who can contribute. And I think that's now with this topic that we are investigating here, the sex gender differences and uh, the, the women's mental health in spe uh, as a special focus. I guess we really have a topic that is hot right now that is also, of course, very well seen and has a visibility, but a topic that is also um, careful to be handled in a way. Mm, because what can we actually contribute with our data? What am I telling you right now? And, and all of these things, we have to be well aware of what we say. Yeah, totally. Um, and you also addressed that you wish for uh, individual treatment of all genders, that this would be um, the goal to reach with mental health. Is there also certain clinical pictures that would profit from that specifically? Or what what can you say about clinical pictures like depression, ADHD, stuff like this in the mm -hmm. context? Mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, of course, I have something in mind. And I think in terms of depression, It's, it's the thing that I already mentioned this, the risk is uh, twice as likely in females than in males. And the question is, is there a diagnostic bias? We have, an, we have several other disorders such as autism, for example, where we have probably a diagnostic bias in the direction of boys and males to actually be diagnosed way more frequently than we diagnose um, girls or women females in this regards. So, uh, yes, I guess that that would actually address some of the gaps that we are seeing right now 
would probably be addressed with an individual approach. Um, and that's just diagnostics. I guess the, there's also this important part, of course, of therapy and therapeutic interventions. And I guess here the individual is even more important and how does this individual respond to this medication versus this neuromodulation effect versus this psychotherapy. And I guess these are all data that we just need to collect because we normally do not compare all of the different therapeutic interventions that we could probably do, but we test one versus another. And that's why we are still limited in a lot of um, aspects and a lot of recommendations that we can hand out to individual patients, what to um, actually advise them to do or what we would recommend. Mm -hmm. Um, you just talked about um, also depression and autism, but um, what do you think about ADHD? Um, it's also been a lot in the media lately that it's more late recognized in women than in men. How do you see a connection to your studies when it comes to that? That's interesting that you raise ADHD. It's not a major focus of mine. So I do not do ADHD research, but it is a topic that is addressed at my department. Um, and yeah, the same is true as for autism. I guess that we do have a diagnostic bias here. And I guess we also should then talk about the symptoms that characterize um, a female or a woman with ADHD versus a male or a man with ADHD. So I guess that that is also something where we then have to go on the symptom level, where we have to look into the developmental trajectory, because it could also be that the developmental aspects are different and it's not the same time point. We also see, for example, time points when we talk about um, gender affirming hormone therapy in transgender individuals, that the effect the hormonal treatment has on symptoms is different in trans men versus in trans women because the hormones that they receive are of course different and versus te testosterone is kind of elevating most of the time the mood but giving estrogen is not that super most of the time mm -hmm. so uh, I guess and that also leads to that if we kind of measure them at the same time six months let's say six months after starting hormone therapy we will see different symptom effects based on the hormone therapy. And I guess that's also something that we need to then see. It's the trajectories of when does an individual respond to a certain therapeutic intervention and with which effects can we actually measure that. And I think that that's also something that we would be interested in, of course, to pursue and to investigate further. You also talked about the hormonal influence. And um, what about the contraceptives that are many times also given at a very young age already to, to female people? Mm -hmm. Well, contraception, of course, is uh, a super topic um, that we also investigate and we also have data. And I guess what I first want to say is that hormonal contraception is super helpful um, because it is working. So it is a contraceptive method and then women do not get pregnant. So I guess that's the first argument for hormonal contraception. It's super effective. The second one is we don't know a lot about what's happening when it comes to hormonal contraception and social affective behavior, for example. So that's what I'm interested in, emotions, mood and empathy. So we did some uh, studies in these regards. And yes, there seem to be effects there. Uh, but there's also a group of women who tolerate contraception very, very well. Um, and there's a group of women who do not tolerate it. Um, and it's still, we do not know how to identify those that tolerate it versus don't, those who do not tolerate it before they actually start taking oral contraception or use any other hormonal contraception method. Um, so there we need more data. There we need to investigate also a little bit better. We'll need to look into starters. We need to look into stoppers of hormonal contraception. And we also need to, of course, look into when do they start? Because um, there is new data from Germany telling us that uh, in society or the general public actually thinks that hormonal contraception uh, should go down and that uh, young girls, adolescents, shouldn't start hormonal contraception or shouldn't start actually the oral contraception. We also see that there's a rise in users of condoms, that the contraceptive method of condoms is rising. Now, if you compare 
the effectiveness of a condom versus a hormonal contraceptive method, there's a huge difference. And I guess that is also a concern that we have to address as scientists who kind of deal with those topics is to inform here and to also talk about side effects, of course, but also the benefits of using one or the other method. And then we come back to your question that you asked me before, what would be an ideal situation? An ideal situation would be if I go to a gynecologist and say, I want to have a contraceptive method. This person would tell me, okay, based on these and these facts of you, based on your individual characteristics, I think you should try this. And that would be the ideal situation. And we are not there yet, but we will reach that. That's a very good outlook. <laughs> so when you talk about the contraceptions, is there actually also within the contraceptions a difference that is worth mentioning or would you just say it's overall similar? No, they are not. They are not. They are not similar. Oh, no. Um, and the oral contraception is... Um, is heavily used uh, by women and it's the most preferred method actually in Europe uh, in terms of hormonal contraception. But we also have other methods and one of the methods that we also investigate is the um, intrauterine device, so the hormonal coil, um, which has way lower dose of uh, synthetic hormones, so just the progestin actually, um, but at a way lower dose, but still has a systemic influence, well, what we assume. Um, so we do not know much about what's happening if women start with the hormonal IUD. And we're just trying to get actually the data on this as well. Um, so there are differences in uh, what is tolerated by women in terms of hormonal contraception, and they are way different. They are way different. They're, for the oral contraceptives, you have different kinds of Uh, synthetic hormones that are combined. You have different dosages that uh, women can take. And for the hormonal IUD, you also have three dosages um, that you can take or use. So I think we have to be careful when we talk about hormonal contraception. What hormonal contraception are we talking about? But can I actually ask you how you perceive the term term of contraception because of this German data now coming out that uh, women shouldn't take oral contraceptives and condoms are getting higher. It may be too personal, but do you have also a view on contraception and uh, contraceptive use? Um, I totally do. Thank you for asking. Um, actually, I think about it quite controversial. I see the positives of it for sure. But in my personal case, just to share my story, I think, for example, that I was given a contraceptive when I was way too young and I wasn't asked about my female history and also my, you know, health history in my family where strokes were also a topic. And I found out quite late that what I have been getting was something I shouldn't have been getting, um, but I wasn't really asked the questions that should have been asked. So when it comes to that... I'm critical about it, but I also see the point of still using a contraceptive. So that's also why I still do use one. But I think there needs to be way better um, clarification in the medical part many times. That's just from my personal experience. Yeah, thank you for sharing, because I think this is actually what we hear a lot back from women, that they have not been informed a lot and that in general, why should they take hormones? Uh, why should they add hormones to their body and in particular synthetic hormones? So I guess that is an absolutely relevant question and we need to address that and we need to inform also what is really happening when you take this hormone and you take another hormone and who are the ones that tolerate it well and who are the ones we shouldn't prescribe any oral contraceptive, for example. But you talked also about the mood and the emotion that you research about. Is this also affected by contraception, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are several studies that indicate this. There are also several studies that do not indicate this. I guess we are talking again about a group, a subgroup of women that are particularly sensitive um, to hormonal fluctuation or to oral contraceptive intake. 
What we do see and what, what is also now where we get first data is what's happening when women have the seven days break of taking oral contraceptive. That, for example, those women who in general have a more negative mood, they experience particularly higher negative mood during the break when the um, oral contraceptive hormones or the synthetic hormones are down and the endogenous are kind of getting up. Um, we also see that for starters and stoppers, there are effects in that. So particularly the stoppers, for example, showed an improvement in mood. But of course, to disentangle, if somebody wants to stop oral contraceptives and then shows a better mood after doing so, may not only be because the synthetic hormones are gone, but because the situation probably has also changed. But we also see the other way around that um, there are, is an increase in negative mood in the starters, but we need way more data on starters to actually say who is the one or who are the ones that actually have this increase in negative mood and who are the ones that don't. That's for the oral contraception. I guess when we talk about the menstrual cycle, there we have a lot more data because we, of course, also have symptoms and we have premenstrual syndrome and we have the premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So that's the clinical disorder that comes up when we really have the depressive mood during parts of the menstrual cycle, particularly during the end of the menstrual cycle when menstruation starts, first days of menstruation, actually the mood symptoms again improve again and then the women have more or less normal mood but then when the progesterone falls, they again get this negative mood. And I, so we do see this uh, association between the hormones and also between mood. We do believe it's progesterone probably as the endogenous hormone that is contributing here. It's not the only hormone contributing here. That would be too simplistic and that would be too simple the story to tell. But at least we're trying to kind of figure out what's happening here. And how can we help those women in particular that go through these monthly negative mood symptoms and they really appear on a monthly basis? And just imagine that every month, you know, OK, now I have again more of my five days where I'm irritated, where I kind of feel pain, where I probably also kind of feel some tension everywhere. So I guess that's really where we need to what we need to address and what we also need to be uh, investigating to kind of help those women. Is there already, based on this connection of mental health and menstrual cycle, some tips you could give for for women in that phase? Or is that too, goes that too far? No, it doesn't go too far. But um, I'm way, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, kind of based on the data that we have acquired, I can actually tell you. It's more or less general tips that, of course, if you know that you will face such a, a phase, maybe if you can do, try to relax more. Try to be good to yourself. Try to uh, kind of um, accept also certain aspects of it. Um, then there are some that now also think about maybe... Um, the metabolism, so what we eat could also help here to focus also on what are you eating, what is making you feel better, um, that that could also influence. And also if you can, of course, um, try to schedule some things um, that do good, that would also be fine. And maybe do not schedule a, a lot of heavy aspects or a lot of stressful elements in those times. But I mean, that's easy said given a daily schedule everybody is facing. So I guess being good to yourself um, and knowing that this is coming up would be my, the easiest advice uh, I can give, or probably the most simple one. And if women are really concerned with their mood, please see a doctor. Please talk about this. Don't be afraid to mention this because there are symptoms and there are disorders that are related to that. And I guess this is also a relief if you can put in to some, it's a relief, not to all. To some, it's a relief if they can put a name to that um, and also know that that is actually existing and they are not a single case. How does it actually um, work? If I hear you now on this podcast and I'm a listener and I actually am a fan and I want to support The study you're doing is there a possibility I can join it? How can I, how can I contribute? Um, well, I guess just writing an email would be a super start. Contacting me, contacting the IRTG, which has a website also, 
um, that would be uh, wonderful. And just asking when you want to contribute um, to one of the projects or the ongoing studies. And we have several ongoing studies. So from puberty to menopausal transition, everybody is welcome to uh, kind of come and join us and also see for themselves what we are doing by contributing. Um, but also, I guess uh, we would be very happy to just hear feedback about the topics that we are addressing. And maybe we do not address a need that uh, somebody has. And please then also raise your voice. Let me know. And um, also kind of give me feedback, what we can do and what we should address in the future. How would you say, did all of this research change you and how do you think it will affect you in the future to go deeper into that field personally? Mm, I think it made me way aware of my hormonal profile. I guess I'm way more aware of uh, monthly changes that I'm undergoing now because of all the research we are doing. Um, and it's a wonderful topic actually to be working in. And I so much love the exchange and the openness that I have with colleagues. Uh, I do not share here on the podcast what topics we are addressing at certain <laughs> meetings, but they are very informative and very psychoeducational. So absolutely necessary to be open about this. And, and I guess that's a wonderful uh, group and a wonderful group of colleagues, but also a wonderful group of um, doctoral researchers that we have here who really embrace the topic uh, in all its facets and levels. So I guess that's one of the things how it does. Of course, as a mother of um, a son and a daughter, I also see consequences there um, in terms of uh, maturation of both of them and also of uh, their aspirations for the future and what are stereotypes that they are facing and that I'm also facing and portraying and maybe also kind of putting onto their lives. So I guess that's also another um, aspect of the work and how it has transformed me. And what also is um, I'm a proud woman. And I guess that's what I can also uh, say that I really love science on women because I am a woman. Uh, and, and so I guess that is also what I want to convey and, and what I want to tell also all of the doctoral researchers, everybody I'm working with is to uh, kind of, I hope that everybody feels well the way they are in their individual way and, and that that is respected and everybody has value and contributes here with um, fantastic ways. So I guess that is also how this the small niche that I now picked in terms of science also um, enlightens, hopefully, not only me, but also others. That is very well put. Thank you. Is there anything else from your research that you still want to share that was very interesting to you? All of it is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's, how it should be. <laughs> it's hard to pick favorites or hard to say. Uh, what is the topic I'm most proud we did or I'm most happy to present? Um, no, I, I just love the, the breadth that we have right now and the variety of questions that we ask right now. Um, so, mm, no. Is there any last words that you want to give to our listeners who are just here with us in the podcast right now? So thank you for giving me the opportunity, first of all, to you um, that I'm here and I can speak about this topic. And for everybody who's listening, well, um, think about sex and gender in your everyday life and also in your research, um, because I think this is a super fascinating topic and it has so much to offer. And for all the um, individuals who want to contribute, just reach out and just get in contact. And I guess if we talk to each other and if we collaborate and if we uh, join forces, um, we will be uh, sooner at the individualized medicine that I talked about um, than if we stay separate and in our own small worlds. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Dr. Dirndl. It was very nice to have you. And also thank you very much for everyone listening. 
If you want to find out more, check out the show notes and also make sure to subscribe to our podcast, share it with your friends and family and get the word out there. See you or better to say, hear you next time. Bye.